Um, good morning and welcome to this, the 11th meeting of 2014 of the European External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off, please? Um, we have no apologies from the committee at present. And agenda item one this morning is an item in today's agenda is the one-off evidence session on the Scottish Government's proposals for an independent Scotland's international development policy. And can I welcome all the witnesses uh, um, along today. And as you'll see, we're doing it as a, a round table format. Um, so before we start, if I can um, just outline some rules of engagement. Um, if uh, you want to comment on each other's contributions, that's absolutely fine. If you just catch my eye and let me know you want back in, um, uh, let me know about that. Uh, if you can sort of make your comments through me, that will allow us to, 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 to proceed uh, in, in a decent manner. Um, and if you can say your name um, before you speak, that would be very, very helpful. And hopefully we'll have a very fruitful um, and interesting discussion. Um, there's a table plan in front of you, so you should know who's who around the table. Um, and we've all got nameplates, so, um, although I can't see the ones down the side, so <laughs> um, I've got a wee table plan here, I'll just stick to that. Um, I'm going to ask you all, uh, to, we're all going to go around the table and introduce myself formally, but before I do that, if I just give the apologies for Pro Professor Carboni, he's um, not been able to join us today, he's had a family emergency, so he's dealing with that, and I'll introduce myself, I'm Christina McKelvey, the MSP for Hamilton, Lark, Collins, Stonehouse, and the convener of the European and External Relations Committee. Thank you, Christine. I'm Hansla Malik. Uh, I'm the vice convener of uh, the committee, and I am uh, represent Glasgow as a regional MSP. I'm Claire Adamson. I'm Central Scotland MSP. Hey, Colin Cameron. I'm from Irvine in Ayrshire. I was the consul for Malawi and Scotland for some 15 years. I'm Hilary Homans, the Director for the Centre for Sustainable International Development, which was set up four years ago at the University of Aberdeen, but prior to that was 13 years working with the UN and 13 with DFID, living and working in sub-Saharan Africa for 10 years. I'm Alec Rowley, um, MSP for the Cowan Beef Constituency. Uh, good morning, my name is James Mackey. I work at ECDPM, the European Centre for Development Policy Management in Maastricht. I also teach uh, international developments at the College of Europe in Bruges. I'm Neil Finn, uh, representing the University of Edinburgh's Global Development Academy. I'm a social scientist. I teach on international development. I'm Roderick Campbell. I'm MSP for North East Fife. Uh, Lloyd Anderson, Director of British Council, Scotland. I'm Willie Coffey, a constituency member for Kilmarnock in Irvine Valley. I'm Gillian Wilson. I'm the Chief Executive of NIDOS, which is the network of international development organisations in Scotland, an umbrella body for international charities. And I just want to apologise for being late. My name is Dave Fish. I'm from rural Lanarkshire, despite my accent. Um, and I, I was previously DFID Director for Africa, but also head of the DFID operation in Scotland, in East Kilbride. Uh, Jamie McGregor. Um, MSP Highlands and Islands Region. Okay, thank you uh, very much. You're all welcome uh, along this morning. And we have got until about 10.30. I think that um, we, we hopefully will get as much uh, packed into that as we, we possibly can. I'm going to start off with quite a general question, quite a gentle one to get, get us kicked off. And it's, it's about this um, idea that Scotland could be a global leader and what that means and wh whether you know your experience in the, the work that you've done either in Scotland and the UK or around the world has actually um, you know given you any confidence in that that Scotland could be a global leader when it comes to international development and I'm just throwing that out there for the first person that catches my eye <laughs> Gillian I think we could certainly be um, a global leader whatever the constitutional outcome so I just want to make clear at the beginning that we're not taking position as a charity, um, but I think certainly in either way, there are certain areas where we could be a real leader. One is um, in terms of the, the idea that the Scottish Government has begun to talk about, and there seems to be some emerging um, consensus in Scotland around taking a more policy coherent approach to international development, in terms of saying that aid is very important, but certainly not sufficient, and we um, would like to look across government about the actions we take and across society the actions we take in terms of making sure that we add value um, in terms of all our actions across. And there are some countries in the world where this is already happening and we could certainly um, join that group but also show where we could lead, for example, in renewable energy or in terms of climate justice. 
Um, Scotland is already the, the first country to have had a really ambitious climate change bill and has also been looking at climate adaptation and being coherent across different areas of government. Um, and I think there are certain areas in other parts of policy coherence where we could really be a leader. So I think, yes. And I've got Dr. Hilary Lomans. Hilary. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is a really important question. And I would perhaps rephrase it differently. And because I think actually in many ways, particularly through the higher education sector, Scotland is already a global leader. Some analysis has been done about the percentage of publications, academic publications that have been done, and Scotland really is up there in the league tables. We had a meeting on the April the 3rd, which was jointly convened with NIDOS and CIFL and also our centre, where as part of the background for that, we consulted all of the higher education institutions in Scotland working in international development and found that there were five particular areas of real expertise in terms of energy, in terms of environment, in terms of global health, and in terms of government governance, which is really important in terms of the social is um, justice issues, and also in terms of capacity building, the long history that Scottish um, universities and institutes of higher education have, particularly in looking at um, capacity building training of people from developing countries and in developing countries. And one of the things that came out of that where we felt we could be strengthened, um, and I notice on page three of your report, it says the Scottish Government currently provides support to two networking organisations. We felt very strongly that there was a role for support to academia, higher education institutes, particularly in the development of what we've called um, research and sustainability develop sustainable development policy hubs around those four, five areas I outlined previously to get, if you like, even greater leverage from the higher education institutes in terms of being able to translate first-class research into policy and practice within the development context. And then the other thing, building on what um, has just been said by Gillian Wilson um, about the Climate Justice Fund, another area where Scotland could, I think, really take the lead is providing a code of conduct of good practice for everyone from Scotland working in international development, whether it be from the business sector, corporate sector, whether it be civil society, higher education, whatever. I think this would be absolutely critical and is really needed, particularly when you look at the post-2015 development agenda and the emphasis on governance, accountability, open and effective systems. So those are just two areas that I think are really important. Small areas as well, yeah. <laughs> just small areas. <laughs> Colin Cameron. Hey, Colin Cameron. Um, first of all, I want to thank the convening committee for being invited along today. I do appreciate it. And I would like to put three bullet points and then I have submitted evidence and I'm quite happy to answer or expand on anything you wish. If, if it's all self-explanatory and there's no questions, uh, no problems. The, th the principle I would work on that Scotland can, in the world scene, give quality it's not quantity we're after here. Mm. And in all aspects that anything I've been involved in, this is how Scotland can be a decisive in showing a way forward. I'll give three points. Um, one is Malawi. Uh, <coughs> Westminster government, through DFID, support Malawi, its current account, with budgetary support. Now, I would hope that uh, the committee and the Scottish Government and all members would consider seeing that on independence, that Scotland would take over a share of that. I think it's important to show in the ongoing relationship with Malawi that the current account is supported too in negotiation with DFID. The second point, which I think is one which we would like DFID to follow, and we would like uh, Scotland to adopt, and it's, if, is in, with regard to capital projects, if Scotland gets involved in that, 
in living in a developing country, it's, it's quite clear that if you have a capital project, the donee country has difficulty in filling the recurrent account arising from that. And I feel strongly we should, and the committee should put forward, uh, that on uh, moving into a capital project, there should be an element of it which is allocated to recurrent costs, say, for covering the recurrent costs of the hospital for three years on a tapering basis, so that when the, the, the uh, hospital is built, people will have been recruited, the wages are there for the first one, two or three years, and it's ongoing. The sad thing you see often in developing countries, the hospital is bit built and it lies empty for three years. So I'm trying to see if we could inbuilt the, uh, the, an element to cover the current expenditure. And the last thing is that I've found over the years uh, with the Scottish Government, successive governments, that they had a committee of people who are interested in this, not elected, but have had experience and had meetings with them on a twice a year basis. We don't have a Senate and we don't have a House of Lords, but some, there should be some group who are willing to speak openly with the Minister and, uh, and the Secretary about their ideas and to speak openly. Now, that can work. What gave me concern when involved was that it wasn't followed through. We, we spent some time preparing for it, and it didn't work. It didn't, wasn't followed through, and I would ask that that might be reconsidered, and that when a group come forward, men and women, to speak with the minister and say that minutes are taken and the points raised by them are dealt with, not accepted. That, that's not what I'm saying. And I, I feel that that would be a, a worthwhile idea. The rest of the stuff I've put on, in my evidence, and I'm happy to expand on that. Thank you. Are other members of the committee going to pick up specific themes that they've got? So we'll, we'll hopefully cover everything that way as well. I've got Dr James Mackey. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me indeed. Um, I, I, pick, I would agree with a number of things that have been said in terms of um, the areas where Scotland could be a specialist, and I think uh, Mr. Campbell's point about we're looking for quality, not quantity, I think is obviously the key starting point. Um, renewable energy, education, governance, uh, certainly. The area I would add would be public finance management. Um, I think we've got a strong financial industry in this country, and um, this is an area which I think is becoming more and more important uh, in international development as we move more and more away from projects managed by outside actors into um, uh, work which the, the government itself conducts and funds are provided through budget support. Um, that is still a limited uh, modality for aid, but I think we're going to move more and more into that um, as uh, internationally we move towards more public goods um, and uh, making public goods available at international level and global uh, and at uh, uh, national level. So I, I think the future lies in um, uh, donors providing budget support to governments and then the governments themselves deciding how they use it. But the condition for that is obviously excellent, very good public finance management. Mm -hmm. And so their expertise uh, is very important. I mean, to reassure both sides of the, the bargain, you need that good solid management. Um, so I, I would really emphasise that a lot. Thank you. Um, David Fish. Thank you. Um, can I start by saying that I, I don't represent DFID, um, although I obviously spent a lot of my working life with them. I'm here as a private individual. Um, and the issue of global leadership is one that I think is really important. Um, and I would say that Britain has been a major global leader in the development scene, certainly since 1997. Um, and Scotland, through um, the presence in East Kilbride, has played a major part in that. Um, to be honest, in the way I see global leadership, it's promoting transformational change, having real impact. And I'm afraid I do not see Scotland being able to exert that sort of influence in the world. Um, 
certainly Scotland would do, as they do now, a lot of very worthy things. Um, the programme that um, I helped, in a way, nurture from East Kilbride at the Scottish office when the power was given to Scotland to have an aid programme. Um, everything I know about what Scotland's done, by and large, has been extremely worthy. But if what you're looking for is to be a global leader, then you're not going to have the weight that comes with being a member of the Security Council, being membership of the board of the World Bank and the IMF. Because with the best will in the world, NGOs do a fantastic job. British NGOs, local NGOs do a fantastic job. But the real transformational change comes when the governments in which, of the countries in which we're working in actually begin to run their countries properly in the interests of all their people. Uh, applies to Britain and Scotland, of course, as well. Um, but the fact is that transformational change is only going to happen when governments in country realise that the resources of the country are there for the benefit of all the people and they're going to put in place systems and processes to make sure that they deliver on those responsibilities. Now, the international community, not just Britain, but Britain has played a leading role in developing arrangements, working often with the World Bank, European Union, lots of other donors internationally, to make sure that there are arrangements in place with local governments to make sure that the development aid we give is used to best effect. It's a long, hard slog in a lot of places, um, and budget support, which has been mentioned, is a crucial <coughs> and has been a crucial part of that effort. And I very much hope that whatever Scotland does, it will consider putting significant amounts of money into that sort of operation. And your commitment to work with the multilateral agencies, I think, will lead you inevitably in that direction. Um, but to give you my interpretation of uh, the answer to your question is I, I don't really see Scotland in a position to be a, a global leader in the way that I interpret it, although there are lots of areas where Scotland can have a really positive influence. Thank you. Jimmy. I just wanted to ask um, uh, Mr Cameron, um, where he says um, the needs and interests of the Doney country are paramount. If he could point to any ex examples in the past where uh, those needs and interests uh, have been upset in some way, or or, or haven't been, you know, that that um, they haven't been seen to be paramount, or, or or mistakes have been made. Yes, the best way is through an example. Um, when I was uh, minister in Malawi on independence, the donors. America, Germany, Japan all came with their wares and they asked what I would like uh, on behalf of Malawi and I suggested that the, there were three bridges washed down and the, on the Lakeshore Road and it would be a fundamental help if they would do that. That is in the interest of Malawi and could they please build it with cement mostly because that is what Malawi has a factory for. And I was politely told, no, uh, we don't think that's a good idea. We think uh, if we were going to build bridges, we would certainly bring our own metal steel in. We wouldn't be using your cement. And in fact, what I got after that, and this is without any disrespect from America, was a transport survey. I think that I try and put as an example to show how the Doni interests are overlooked at a time when perhaps they're important. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Okay, I've got a couple of other folk who want to come in. First, I've got Dr Lloyd Anderson. Uh, thanks very much. Um, can, I, can I just uh, preface my remarks by, by saying that um, uh, the British Council makes a major contribution to the UK's uh, international development targets so that in 2011-12 uh, we spent uh, £91.8 million pounds of our grant on development in, um, in ODA, uh, Official Development Assistance Countries, um, and by 2015 we'll be spending 64% of our grant on development work, so it is a very major part of our uh, 
um, our interest. Um, secondly, we, we have a very long uh, and strong track record in delivering donor-funded um, development programs, particularly in um, Middle East, North Africa, uh, Asia, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, and those being funded by DFID and EU and others. Um, and thirdly, I think I uh, just wanted to mention that obviously a lot of our cultural relations activity um, supports international uh, development. Um, and it's particularly a focus on capacity building. So we work with um, to increase in, uh, education on employment opportunities for young people, promote democracy, good governance, empower uh, civil society, and, and giving people a vote. So I just want to sort of lay our, our credentials down. I mean, I do, do think that um, there, there is a strong belief in Scotland in public good. And, uh, and I think that's actually a very important driver for, for Scotland's uh, interests in, in international development. Um, I think I worry about um, the future and, and, and listening to previous comments is absolutely true. Uh, if you look at school links, and we could go into this, uh, an awful lot of schools in, in Scotland have links with uh, ODA countries. And there's a real interest, I think, through the curriculum in, in what's uh, you know, happening uh, in the developing world. Uh, similarly, the HE sector, uh, we could point to a, a lot of uh, HE links with, um, with, with ODA countries. Um, but uh, if you look at the flows of uh, students, um, the flows are inward. Uh, the flows are to Scotland and not from, from Scotland going abroad. Uh, and I think there's a real issue about uh, young people in Scotland not being uh, outward, outwardly mobile, uh, and therefore uh, that's going to have a dramatic effect on the ability of Scotland to uh, be involved in international development or deliver uh, assistance uh, if it's young people are not that interested in, what, in, 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 in traveling abroad and, and seeing the issues abroad. Do you want in now, Doc? I'm just I'm conscious that everyone's had their say. And... What I have to say will come in later. So yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Um, Doctor makes a very good point in, in terms of relationship of students, and I think that's, that's an important element for us, because international activity amongst students in particular is important because it creates uh, un unpaid ambassadors around the world for, for, for both uh, countries involved. Would there be any mileage in having an exchange system of students? Do you think we, we, we could um, secure funding where we could actually have an exchange of students going overseas and bringing students from there back so in a reciprocal agreement as such, so that we could, that would be possibly another way of trying to encourage that activity? I think it needs kick-starting again. Uh, I think it's become dormant and people have maybe lost the idea of having Scotland as a destination. So if we, if we kick-start the system with some sort of pilot project, would, would there be any mileage in that? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think we've got to uh, uh, address the uh, reciprocity of, of, um, of the student flows. Um, at the moment, as I say, it's, it's, it's very seriously imbalanced uh, towards the flows into Scotland. Actually, um, just mentioning the Commonwealth Games, um, uh, it's interesting um, the links that are being made between the schools and, and universities and Commonwealth countries because of the Games. Um, but again, uh, it's tended mostly to be an inward flow uh, so I think exchange programs are important. You, you, you um, actually deliver the Erasmus program. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, yes, I mean, that's in, in Europe. Uh, and that's successful, but the, you know, the uptake is still, it's still low. Yeah. And this committee's kept an eye on, and certainly yeah. in our inquiry in uh, teaching languages, to primary school children, the, the you know, a sort of a generational change there of having these multilingual 
uh, kids that will that will go and see their way around the world and come back and share their experiences. Something that this, you know, the government is and this committee has taken a keen interest in. Uh, on Erasmus, and Scotland is at the bottom of the table. Yeah. 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 In in terms of, of out, outward mobility. Yeah. We've got a bit of promotion to do there, haven't we? Dr. Mackey. Yes, I just wanted to come in on exactly this point of Erasmus because there is a, um, a new um, element of Erasmus, which is Erasmus Mundus now, um, and a cooperation between the Erasmus program and the Nyerere program for the African Union, which is beginning to gather momentum. And uh, I would say that indeed Scotland would need to, uh, the government could put quite a bit of effort pushing that, uh, and making it better known, and the language question, as you say, though if you wanted to go to different parts of Africa, Scottish students would have the language of English and it would be all right. And I've got Gillian Wilson. I just wanted to take up the point about the students and global education. Um, I think we would certainly support the idea that we would like the, you know, the upcoming generation of people in Scotland to be well aware of, of our role in the world and of the, the need for there to be more justice in the world. And certainly, I think, having young people go abroad and really see other, other cultures and other ways of life is a very valuable thing. We would widen that and ask that there is um, funding and support for wider global education in schools, not just in terms of exchange, but the wider understanding of why are there poor people in the world, what are the root causes of poverty, how can we work. Um, this is one of the themes in our report on policy coherence, that this is an, an important element of making sure that young people are aware of their role as consumers, that they keep governments accountable in terms of things like... Um, tax evasion and the sort of economic system that we have. So I think it needs to be a very wide system of global education where we're really looking not just at it's interesting to learn about a different culture, but it's important to actually tackle the way we are as consumers, what our government does in terms of the way it operates trade, procurement, that there, you know, it's a much wider issue of, of building um, other themes of justice into, the, into young people's understanding. And I think our report looks into some of the really important themes that not only would we educate our children about, but that we need to make real transformational change. Um, David was saying, you know, it, it, it's, it would be really good if we're looking at transformational change, not just change in terms of um, things that we can directly do in terms of delivering development projects, but really transforming the way we are in Scotland and the way we operate with the world in terms of our econom economic Exchange. One of our members, Oxfam Scotland, is particularly pushing the idea of the Humankind Index and making sure that the way we operate as an economy is focused much more on people and planet and the benefit of people rather than on um, economic growth. So I think all of these kinds of aspects, both in terms of doing them in a coherent way that we are actually checking how we operate as a government and, and as consumers and as businesses in Scotland, the impacts we're having on other countries in terms of development impact. We can add so much more value if we're not just giving money, but we're actually operating in a way that is good for Scotland, but also adds values for other countries. And I think young people need to be aware of that much wider um, aspect of their education, that it's not just exchange is good, but it needs to be much wider than that. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think all of my colleagues around this table will tell you that in the recent, uh, maybe in the past few years actually, rather than months, um, 10 and 11 year olds that come to this parliament as part of the democracy project have usually got questions from Syria to uh, poverty to hunger to climate justice to whether people have got clean water in the world, and amazing questions coming from 10 and 11 year olds. So if we can you know, embed it into that, that age group, then we can certainly be uh, making a bit, a bit of a difference there. I think we're Obviously, we're quite quite tight for time. I've got Alec Rowley wants to come in next, and then I think we'll move on to Claire Adamson, who will move on to a different topic. Um, but we'll allow everyone to try and get their their, 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 their bit in anyway. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering if if um, yeah, Doctor yeah. Doctor Thin's wanting in now, so that you've got your. I wanted to make a point yeah, on this well, particular discussion. Ongoing, then we'll right. go to Alec Rowley next. Will I go now? Yeah, right. yeah. Well, I just think we should take very seriously this, this warning that one way or another we're, we're not doing as much as we could to lead uh, Scots towards um, active 
global citizenship, to use a bit of uh, jargon. And uh, yes, schooling systems and yes, university courses and yes, exchange systems are, are important parts of, of, of the pathway towards that. If you look at model global citizens, people that really express global citizenship in, in, in incredibly impressive ways, very often a key trigger is a moment of uh, international volunteering in their, early, uh, in their early years. It comes up in the biographies of famous people. It comes up when you talk to people about how they got involved. And so we shouldn't neglect the, the, the role of uh, um, support for international volunteering experience. And uh, there's lots of ways that you can do that. There was a UK report strongly emphasising the importance of, for example, gap year and career break um, volunteering, the need for support for those. Um, uh, and I would also add to that, if possible, if we could support international global volunteering that isn't entirely deficit-oriented, that is not entirely oriented towards uh, removing uh, a few um, harms or, or building a few school sheds, but is actually you know, aiming a bit higher than, uh, than that. So the people learn not just about poverty and harm and suffering uh, in, uh, in far-flung parts of the world, but they learn about the good things about those societies. So volunteering is well worth emphasising here. That's all I'll say on that. Thank you very much. Alec Rowley. Thanks, Convener. I, mean, I think what was encouraging from, from all the contributions is that what we are seeing is that, that there's a lot of good things happening in Scotland in terms of international development, higher education um, and, and so on. But I suppose for me the question would be that there, there has been a focus on international development that focuses on the amount of, of aid. And, and the White Paper, for example, highlights 0.7% moving to a target of 1%. And I note that some people are saying it's not simply about that. And I suppose my question would be from a, a policy perspective, whether, whether it's an independent Scottish state or whether it's a government within the UK, what is it at government level in Scotland, from a policy perspective, what should be the priorities, do you think, of a Scottish government looking at this area I work? Question directed to? I'm just generally in discussion. Yep. Colin Cameron. I would just like to, to answer the question, but also to mention, go back to the question of leadership. I really think we want to look at the definition of what you and I mean by leadership. Uh, Scotland on independence is five million people, and I, I think it will take its seat in all the different communities in accordance with us country that is of that size, where our leadership is directed to, I think, is through our own initiative and the example we can give. And I think that it's not aiming to get to top of where we are here. It's the initiative and example that we can give. One example I can show is that through the Scottish Malawi Partnership and that we are endeavouring now to establish a plan to give all secondary school pupils in Scotland to have an individual pen pal with a Malawi pupil and vice versa. And all done without cost to any of the Malawi pupils because postage and that is expensive. Now that is the thing I think is the sort of leadership we want to see coming through and will see coming through after independence. Okay, I've got ooh, a few people. Dr Hildy, Homans, yep. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alex, for that question. I think it is a really critical question, and I think there's two sides to it. One is the agreement amongst OECD countries to the 0.7%, which is one issue. And the second issue is the extent to which Scotland should be aspiring to that. <coughs> and I think I would agree with the submission by Edinburgh I think really what we need to do is to focus much more, not so much on the total sum, and I'm a little bit worried about aid because aid is not what a lot of governments want these days. President of Malawi and Rwanda have said really what we want is not aid, what we want is technical support, we want other sorts of support. Um, and I think also the point about the international financial institutions and big, big business, they're actually contributing through their work quite substantially to the development process. And I think this is where I would go back to needing this code of conduct for who's working in development. Because for me, the main issue is around sustainability and doing good 
um, rather than sums of money. And we don't at the moment have adequate systems for measuring the transparency issues, the accountability issues about how money is being spent at all different levels. So I would want to link the question with, well, what is the money for and how is it being spent? Who is benefiting? How are we tracking that? And how can we ensure that any investment Scotland is making is actually sustainable and not leading to dependence? Because in many countries, the emphasis now is on programs which are interdisciplinary, wide sector looking at issues rather than small scale projects. So I think there are a whole load of issues in your questions that need to be addressed. Thank you. Very much. We've got David Fish and then Gillian. Sorry, did you say me? David, uh, sorry. Um, having worked for DFID and its predecessors for almost 100 years, um, the question of aid levels was, has always been an issue, going back to the 50s and 60s. Um, and I think it's great that Scotland feels able to match the commitment that's been made after many, many years by the British government to the 0.7. Um, but it is more important to ensure that what we do with that money is A, doing what it says on the tin for the people, the recipients, but also that you can explain to your constituents in Scotland what they're getting for their money. Um, and to go back to some of the things Mr Cameron was saying, um, my first job overseas was in Swaziland in 1968. Um, and we did, we tended to do what he said. We built a school, but we didn't think about whether there were any teachers there. Um, we built a road, but we didn't make any arrangements for making sure it was maintained. And in those days, we could only spend on capital. We didn't have the ability to spend on recurrent money. The world has moved on hugely. I mean, we don't invest in capital projects now without a thorough investigation of the technical feasibility, the financial sustainability. I'm not saying that we always get it right, but there's a huge amount of effort that goes into um, project and program appraisal. I think, going back to Mr Early's question, I mean, the trick is going to be for Scotland to focus on a number of areas where it can make a real difference. I have to say that ministers, given the inclination, will spread money all over the place. Um, and when the Scottish programme started off, ministers wanted to do activities in 20 odd countries and we helped focus them down to a very small number and I think as a relatively small donor you're going to be constrained a bit by your overseas presence you're not going to have an office in all of the world's poorest countries I wouldn't have thought so you're going to have to have in place arrangements to manage programs locally to make sure that you're in touch with the politics locally <coughs> because at the end of the day, investments, especially through government, are not going to work if the politics aren't right. So my recommendation to a Scottish government would be continue to focus on a small number of countries, build up your expertise in country, don't try and run everything from Edinburgh or wherever, um, decide you're going to make a real difference, find a niche in those countries, it may be financial management, it may be technical expertise, engineering. I mean, there's a whole history of engineering in Scotland. But be realistic about what you can do. Do it very well and do it in a way which enables you to report back to the people of Scotland what you've done with that money. And a friend from the European Union will, will tell you, the international organisations and the consortia that get together to run big programmes put a huge amount of effort into tracking expenditure, regular reviews. You look at things every three, four, five months to make sure, because the world moves on. You know, you approve a project in 2000. By 2002, all sorts of things have happened. So the management of activity and development is hugely different to what it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, it is professional. Um, Scotland is clearly potentially as capable of doing that as anyone else. Um, but I really strongly recommend you don't try and run aid programmes in 20 different countries or 25 different countries. Gillian Smith. Gillian Wilson, sorry. Yeah. Um, 
we would certainly agree with a lot of what Hillary was saying in terms of um, needing to look at a much bigger picture. We um, would strongly welcome the cross-party support that there is at the moment for an aid program. We would love in an ideal world that aid wasn't required and that through, for example, um, coming back to the policy coherence thing, we would much prefer it, that the world works well and that these countries are able to generate their own revenue, to have their own business growth, to have their own people running their own government, and, and that aid isn't needed, like the Marshall Plan in Europe. You know, the ideal situation is that you don't need aid, and we would agree with that. Governments don't want to be dependent, and people don't want to be dependent on the ground. However, we're not in an ideal world, and I think it's, it, we really welcome that there is commitment cross-party in Scotland and in the UK government for 0.7% at the moment. In the short term, people are in really dire need, and there needs to be some aid while you're working in the background to remove the need for aid through transformational change. So in terms of the, the aid, you know, and, and we very much support some of the transformational shifts that are being proposed through post-2015 for the new framework, where it's looking very much at partnerships, collaborations between different players, the business sector, the higher education sector, government, civil society. It can't work with any of those players just working in isolation. So we would agree with a lot of the points that, that Hillary was making on that one. However, in terms of the actual aid itself, we, we would recommend that the government really looks at aid that changes things for the long term, both in terms of empowering people on the ground. Some various people have been making points about good governance. Absolutely, that's important. One of the things that drives good governance is people having the capacity to keep their own governments to account. So we would very much see the government investing in supporting civil capacity to do that, helping people to understand their rights locally, taking a, a rights-based approach to the aid program, but also looking at other elements of sustainability in terms of environmental sustainability, economic sustainability. Um, another very important element which we welcomed in in the white paper was the idea of gender and, in, and uh, focusing on empowering women. There's been so much research which shows that if you build the capacity of women, then there's real transformational change. So we, we really welcome that in the white paper, but also would um, um, emphasize that. And there are other things around an aid program that we would also welcome, such as um, looking at relieving unjust debt, it's important that governments have their own capacity to generate revenue, and um, a lot of that revenue at the moment is coming back to countries in terms of, of debt payments. I think we recently had a visitor from Pakistan who um, is director of Avaz CDS, which is a civil society umbrella body in Pakistan, and he was giving us shocking statistics that in Pakistan, 40% of the budget is spent on defense, 40% on debt relief, and 4% on MDG-related service delivery in Pakistan. So it just shows you the importance of some of these other things that need to go on around aid. You know, aid, like I said, is so important in the short term. People are living in dire poverty, and we can't just say, well, we don't need aid. Um, in the short term, we certainly do. But there's so many other factors that we really need to look at, and we would welcome Scotland looking at um, either in, in its existing constitutional state or an independent state in terms of relationships with the UK government, looking at debt relief, as well as things like Scottish companies paying tax in, in the countries in which they operate. So I think there's a lot of factors around aid, but we would certainly, um, we welcome it and we uh, welcome the fact that um, it might even be legislated for in, in the short term. Yeah, I think we want to expand on that, that topic a wee bit. I think Claire Adamson, have, you've got a sort of a theme base, based on uh, debt relief and, and the areas involved in that, yeah? Oh, sorry. Kevin, that wasn't where I was going with the question next. Sorry. Um, yeah, the, um, the white paper has, has got quite detailed information about um, the, the sort of no harm policy in terms of, of, of um, how it would move forward. And I was just wondering if you could give me just a, a, an understanding of what, what that means to you in terms of, of how we would deliver the aid. Or the funding? Anybody? Like the <laughs> um, yeah, certainly. Could go first certainly. Thing, yeah. um, we, we, we welcome that the government has policy coherence in, in the white paper. 
and that there is um, actually emerging cross-party consensus in Scotland. So as, as hopefully some of you will know, we've produced a report called Scotland's Place in Building a Just World, and I have copies with me if anybody wants it. It's also downloadable on the website. And within that report, we, we are calling for this policy where not only does um, Scottish Government give aid, but it also um, takes a lens across government activity, like, very much like it would on an environmental impact assessment or a gender review, that it takes an approach which is um, policy coherent for adding value to development and, and a pro-poor um, policy. So um, the Scottish Government has taken up that idea and expressed it as, to some extent, expressed it as do no harm. And we certainly... Um, would welcome that a government checks what it's doing for harm. Um, so, you know, we do welcome that, and it's certainly a good start. And the government, but we would be calling the government to be much more proactive. Um, so checking for harm is a good thing, but we would be calling for something much more proactive, more adding value, where we would hope that the government didn't just check for damage, but looked at opportunities across government to really add value. So, for example... Um, I gave a quick example at the very beginning about um, being joined up between different departments around um, our climate justice work. So not only do we have a bill that is trying to cut emissions in Scotland, both in terms of that um, being good for Scotland, but also in terms of the huge impacts that global um, change is having on some very vulnerable communities in poor countries. But, so that's one aspect but we're also having a climate justice fund, which is adding um, funding, very welcome funding for climate adaptation for communities abroad. We're also educating our children about climate change. So, you know, this is much more about adding value than simply not doing harm. We, we would see the government um, looking for opportunities to be pro-developmental in everything it does. Procurement's another example, where the government has um, £9 billion of spend. It could be checking that it didn't do harm, but it could also be saying proactively, we want to um, buy products that are ethically sourced. So we welcome a do-no-harm approach, but we would expand that and ask for a much more added value approach. Okay, you want to... Uh, could, could I, uh, if I could just um, maybe... Um quote from the white paper in terms of um, the Scottish Government's position. It says, we will not allow commercial or other considerations, including, including military considerations, to influence our approach improperly. Um, and the reason I raise that is because it seems in contrast with some of the information that's in, in the public domain about where Westminster might be going with this. And Tobias Elmwood, the Prime Minister's envoy to NATO, had drawn up, quote, detailed proposals for Downing Street, suggesting that there is an overwhelming case for military spending to count towards the 0.7 GNI target. Um, are there concerns in the room about um, how, how, how that target might be, the different approaches to that target that might emerge um, from Westminster or from an independent Scottish government? James Mackey? Um, certainly. Um, I think there is an ongoing debate in the OECD about the, uh, what qualifies as ODA and there have been uh, underlying currents for some years that maybe the debate should be reopened. Um, certain, and I think what we're finding across Europe is that a number of governments are becoming much more uh, uh, prone to um, uh, stating their own interests in deals with, uh, in, uh, in cooperation with developing countries. Um, and those interests may also be trade. Um, whether it goes as far as trade in arms is, is uh, another question. One area where there is uh, perhaps some uh, on, on the military side is in peacekeeping forces, um, in that aid money can be used for uh, certain aspects of uh, peacekeeping work, particularly the, the, um, the, uh, the allowances for soldiers who are taken away from, who are in peacekeeping operations away from their, uh, their regular barracks and so on, but obviously not on armaments or munition or anything like that. And I think it would be a, a great shame if that, that was changed. But I, don't, I think it's, it's hard to avoid this wider debate about we should be stating our own interests in it. And this is partly because uh, we are now more and more confronted with uh, the South-South cooperation, 
um, and India, Brazil, China, other countries which are saying we're not here just to aid, we're here to strike mutually beneficial, um, beneficial uh, agreements and cooperation which helps both sides. Now, some of that may be a bit disingenuous, but I think it does strike a chord with many developing country governments. They prefer to be dealt with and, uh, by uh, donors who say, well, this is what we'd like out of this deal, um, but we're prepared to help you with, uh, with uh, that side of it. So it's not an easy area, and to be pure, if you like, um, or absolute in your approach to that will, will, is, is fraught with difficulties. Okay, uh, Dr. Nielsen? Uh, this was a point on the do no harm, not on the... Uh, yeah. You're happy with that? Uh, so do no harm, uh, obviously, it needs to be interpreted not literally. Uh, you cannot do aid without harm happening. Um, that needs to be clear. And there is a serious point that this is not just a philosophical quibble, there's a serious point because the, 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 the potential for taking do no harm too far uh, and distorting your aid pro program uh, in a risk averse direction um, is potentially at odds with the, the objective of actually helping those countries that need uh, the help most. Uh, so I think we should take very, very seriously the possibility not just of the obvious sort of high visibility harm that Dave assures us is, is a little bit rarer now, thanks to much, much better, uh, 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 better checks, <clears throat> but to low visibility harm that creeps over, over generations uh, and that comes from things like aid fragmentation, uh, which again, Dave has very helpfully warned, warned us against. You do not help countries by giving lots and lots of bits and pieces of aid and lots and lots of delegations. You undermine their democratic process by doing so. You do not help the poor of the world by helping corrupt regimes. I notice here there was a recommendation from Mercy Corps that I did not understand uh, that was about aligning Scottish funding with poverty levels, fine, uh, with income inequality, a bit more controversial, and with fragility. I don't understand the fragility bit. Uh, so so uh, when, we, when we choose, I absolutely desperately hope that Scotland, uh, if it does have a program, uh, an aid program that attempts to spend a billion pounds a year, that it does so uh, with a very, very small number of, of partner countries, and that, it's, uh, 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 and it, that it considers looking below country level because a huge number of the world's poor are living in pockets of very, very large uh, countries. It considers having partnerships with, uh, with uh, sub-national level um, uh, uh, agencies. Uh, and that it, uh, uh, and that it, before it embarks on any massive spending program, that it looks very, very clearly at things like the code of conduct, with, uh, which uh, Henry suggested, uh, linking up uh, any aid programs with non-aid channels of influence that Scotland might have in those countries. Last time I sat before this committee, I think it was seven years ago, I mentioned that Scotland's influence on international development was far, far greater through non-aid channels, including finance. And, of course, a year later, it became clear just how badly we had been performing, just how much harm we had been doing through those, those financial uh, institutions. So it's absolutely crucial that the aid programme is, is systematically linked up with the best knowledge that we have of uh, non-aid influences and the best means we have of minimising harm and maximising goods through those channels. Um, got Dr Lloyd Anderson and Colin Cameron. I've got to Colin first because he's waiting for a wee bit. Both, both of them have been waiting for a bit. If I could Colin. comment on the question of debt relief, I would like a statement from the Scottish Government or from the Scottish Parliament that under no circumstances would any of the aid budget be transferred to any quasi-military use. And I think that's a fundamental principle that I would like to see Scotland stand up for. Now, I agree that debts should be identified and some of them written off. That is right, and I think it's, it's a tremendous help to the donee country if certain of the bad debts just go. That has been shown in the past. But, and taken from the aid budget to that effect. But I think it's also helpful if at the same time as you identify a need to be a, a debt to be written off, that you have a parallel a proposal or project there which would be implemented at the same time as the debt is written off. Now, the reason for that is it is to try and ensure that the donee country doesn't immediately, a debt is written off, is in a position then to take on a new one, because that is a real risk. And anyway, 
as much as possible, uh, aid should be by grant, and I, I find it difficult to justify uh, always looking at loans to countries. But the do no harm, that is, that is right, the policy is right. The only thing I would ask is that we don't use that as an excuse for not doing something. Sometimes, well, we might, we might have a, a problem here if we do that, we have a difficulty. I think in aid we have to face up to difficulties and don't use that as an excuse not for doing it. And finally, I think it's um, important that we try and not spread our resources too thinly because they become ineffective and quantity, not a quality, not quantity, is really the, the key and to stay within the budget. Okay, Dr Lloyd Anderson. Um, thanks. Um, I think that there is a bit of tension with the, the, the international priorities of the Scottish Government in the sense that obviously there's a focus on, uh, on emerging economies and, uh, um, and therefore you have the BRICS and you have uh, 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 these countries. Um, and, and then there's a tendency to sort of focus on Malawi when it, when it comes to international development. Um, and, and, and so maybe uh, Malawi could actually be the hub uh, for uh, engagement um, wider in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. I would say Pakistan is also now features in the international development work of the Scottish Government, and, and, and that's been a good thing, particularly actually with regard to gender inequality, which we'll come on to. I just wanted to mention um, the Sunday uh, Herald um, has been uh, following the, the, the progress of the Queen's Baton Relay, um, and you'll have seen that uh, it's been in Jamaica. Um, and, and just a, a piece from the article that um, there are 2,300 Campbells listed in the Jamaican telephone directory, uh, <clears throat> and there are actually more Campbells per square mile in Jamaica than there are in Scotland. Um, and we all know... I don't, I don't know where this is going. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, I don't know where you're going with this. Okay. Um, but uh, and 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 of course this this is uh, this is um, uh, a heritage from the slave trade and from from history and so on. Um, and that at the moment, 50 cents of every Jamaican dollar uh, is being spent to to pay off that country's debts. Um, there there is something about the history of Scotland and its role uh, in empire and in the world. Which, which makes one think that if you were looking at priorities uh, and, and this do no harm, that, that there are ad adjustments that need to be made. I've been following the Commonwealth Kids uh, um, programme in the, the Sunday Herald uh, for the past few weeks. Really interesting stories coming from the young people there as well. It's excellent. Um, I have got Dr Holmans, and then I'm going to move on to Jamie McGregor's area of questioning because we're vastly quickly running out of time. Um. Thank you very much. First of all, um, I just wanted to reiterate what several people have said about really not spreading any support too thinly and the need for focus. But on the to do no harm principle, I think we have to be really careful in terms of how we define harm. Often in many programs, there are unintended consequences which are very difficult to predict from the outset. And it leads me to a point that I feel very strongly about is the need for measurement and accountability so we're able to track things. I think this is absolutely critical and I think it's one of the key features of the Millennium Development Goals, that the Millennium Development Goals for the first time established or enabled some systems of measurement and tracking in many countries are still very rudimentary. Um, but just taking the Millennium Development Goals, I guess it's a question which often perplexes me, that it seems to me, particularly in some areas, particularly around maternal health, for example, we may have done harm because we've actually increased the inequalities between women being able to access reproductive health services. So the Millennium Development Goals in that area have actually benefited the middle classes and upper classes 
and I'm not going to say at the expense of the poor, but there has been this increase in inequality, and particularly in some countries like Nigeria, where you actually have now moving to middle income status level, you have some of the highest levels of inequalities in access to reproductive health services and maternal health outcomes. So I think this means how we define harm needs to be very, very carefully considered. And I would want us to think very carefully about always having an emphasis on reducing inequalities, which isn't strongly enough articulated for me in the white paper and in the documentation. Thank you. Very much. Jamie, if we move on, I know you've got a couple of supplementaries, but if we move on to your area of question as well, I'll allow us to just I'll cover that whole... Areas, but that, I'll, you I'll just take one. knock yourself right, out. Well, <laughs> I'll be as quick as I can. Um, on delivery, delivery of an international development policy by um, what uh, um, Dr James Mackey uh, describes as a new donor Scotland, or possible new donor Scotland, um, a couple of practical questions... Uh, what kind of structures and staff does he see being required, and would it require a new international body? What would be the likely costs of setting up the appropriate delivery mechanisms? And are there concerns that the new structures and staff would use resources that otherwise would have gone directly to international aid? Um, thank you. Yes, well, I mean, I'm actually arguing that Scotland should consider not setting up a new structure and that um, precisely to reduce aid act fragmentation, the government should consider actually using existing structures uh, at the multilateral level, the EU and NGOs. But having said that, you would nevertheless need some ability to scrutinize, evaluate, um, and uh, um, set policy, etc. But to me, that can be done with a relatively limited staff. I mean, if you look around the European Union, um, and I gave some examples in my, my uh, um, submission, the, the staffing levels we're talking about uh, um, for delivering a small aid program, so actually having delivery capacity, we're talking about 200 to 300 staff, etc., spread over. But if you really focus down and said, we are not going to set up a separate agency, we're going to work through... Um, existing agencies and fund the UN, fund the, put money through the EU, fund NGOs, you could actually reduce that even further. And I think there is a big benefit to doing that. I mean, it's, it would be a revolutionary thing to do. There's very few countries very, uh, which work like that, but I think it would, would really address the problem of aid, aid fragmentation because inevitably, if you, set, if you become a new donor, you're, uh, you're actually contributing to this problem of even more fragmentation of aid. And that would be one way around it. David Fish. Um, I mean, nice idea, James. But, I mean, the reality is that if Scotland has a very significant aid programme, it's not politically practical, I don't think, for you guys not to have an aid agency of some description. Um, and I think the political pressure is on you to establish a a mini, mini DFID will be quite strong. Um, my advice to you would be that you should do it because it needs a huge amount of professionalism to make an aid programme work. Um, my advice would be to house it very close to your Ministry of Foreign Affairs and your Ministry of Defence because one of the problems we've had over many years is that... Uh, there's been fragmentation in terms of policy. Um, but the reality is, and to go back to a point Neil was making about risk, um, donors are becoming more risk averse. And partly that's because of the accountability issues and what the man in the street thinks. But actually, the real transformational activity does require quite often significant risk. So if you take a Sierra Leone, for example, where we had a military intervention by Britain which sowed the seeds of progress for that country. We've had to go in and put money direct into the budget, and we'll have to do it for quite a long time. Um, politically, quite controversial. But 
absolutely vital that you've got coordination within government of government activity. You are going to have a Ministry of Defence, aren't you? In Scotland? Um, I, I, sorry, I, <laughs> but there is. There's the a whole <laughs> section in the white paper on defence. Uh, it's very important that whatever structure you set up, you house them close together, in my view. So, if you're tempted to take 100 people from DFID East Kilbride and leave them in East Kilbride, I would say that's not a brilliant idea. Unless you're going to put the Ministry of Defence in East Kilbride and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in East Kilbride. I would house them closely together. Um, I would certainly agree with James that, and the paper does say this, you're going to put a significant amount through existing channels. You're putting money through the EU, putting money into the World Bank, putting money into the African Development Bank, you can be pretty assured that they're going to be dealt with professionally. Might be expensive, but they're going to be dealt with professionally. But the Scottish people, to be honest, if they really want a development programme, are going to want some sort of individual identity for Scotland. I'm sure the Malawi programme is popular. It wouldn't be popular if it was going through the European Union or somewhere else. So I think politically you're going to have to have bilateral programmes. As everybody's saying, having five, six or seven of them would enable you to do them all extremely well, I would hope. Um, but don't contract it all out to the internationals, is, is my advice. Gillian Wilson. Yeah. Um, we would certainly agree with this idea of being cross-departmental. Um, the policy coherence approach, for example, the model in Sweden, is where they have both um, a cross-parliamentary committee and a cross-departmental committee so that there's a political and an administrative um, structure that is very, um, you know, that, that is looking at policy coherence um, coherently. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we would definitely agree with this idea of working through different departments because we, um, as we were saying a bit earlier, um, are interested not just in the aid programme but it being um, much more um, an approach across government. So we would certainly agree with having um, more joined up government. Um, and there's some examples of that already in the Scottish Government. So for example, the International Development Committee and the Climate and Energy Team and the Water Team are already beginning to have conversations together so that they're working together. So we, we would see an extension of that, of having a parliamentary committee and um, an administrative um, cross-departmental committee looking at Scotland's impact abroad internationally. We would, however, also agree, I think, if we're going to have an aid programme, there needs to be sufficient capacity both in terms of numbers but also expertise and experience within the, the staffing of the Scottish Government to deliver a, a good quality aid programme. And we are concerned at the moment that the very small but very dedicated team hasn't got sufficient capacity to do all the different roles it has at the moment. Um, aid, the aid programme is important, but often um, the staff in that team get pulled to other places. So I think it would be very important that a Scottish um, aid programme was well resourced with, with um, experienced people and enough people. Um, and we would also, um, yeah, I think that's enough. Just, just following on that uh, I think the House of Commons International Development Committee report said we're concerned that DFID doesn't engage sufficiently with Scottish organisations. Is there something that could be learned from current experience? What do you think about that? And that comment? We, we um, certainly feel that DFID could be doing more in terms of engaging with the Scottish, um, I can only speak from civil society, but I think that would equally apply to the higher education sector, to other business players in Scotland. I think they, they haven't been doing that as much as they could. They're beginning to do it more. So the event that Hillary recently referred to, um, collaborative event that we did with Aberdeen University and um, CFAL Scotland, they did engage, they're beginning, their post-2015 team is beginning to talk to people in Scotland, how they could do, do it a lot better. Um, and I think the, the learning from that is that um, if, if Scotland was an independent country or even um, within uh, you know, the existing constitution, government, both UK and Scottish, could be much more um, engaged with a whole range of players in, in the country. Um, yeah. Um, I've got 
Dr Neil Finn and then we'll go back to Jamie for you to continue with your line of questioning. I'll just be brief. This is a, 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 I'm following up on Gillian's point, answer, answer to Jamie's. Uh, y yes, I, I think it's very important to think as separately as we can about whatever new structure might be needed to manage this huge, huge aid programme. Uh, and whatever, separately, whatever structure we could uh, devise that would actually ensure policy coherence uh, to, to understand better our, uh, our roles in international development. And there is a little lesson here, I think, from the, was it 2003, roughly 10 years ago, in a way, we, we, we uh, drafted our uh, Scottish international development policy. Uh, we then, following on from that, started a, a, a programme that I think now spends nine million or so. So in aid terms, a tiny, tiny, tiny little programme, absolutely tiny, but high profile in the public interest. Um, uh, now, uh, to support that, uh, in, in the, the Scottish Government's Office for International Development, we devised a committee with a couple of academics, myself was one of them, and, we, and uh, somebody, it was one from DFID, and there was uh, somebody from the church, and it, uh, you know, it, it, I urge that it should be expanded to include members from business and trade unions, perhaps, and from financial institutions. Um, but the committee was there. But the lesson that I learned from that is that, that even the tiniest aid program can distract your attention entirely from the business of understanding international development. The committee never, never discussed what it was set up to do, which was to understand how this policy could be implemented, other than to discuss tiny little donative projects. So we never had formal meetings to discuss policy. Uh, we had cocktail parties endlessly. Jack McConnell was very generous, invited us to dinner <laughs> lots of times. Um, uh, and very occasionally we discussed the fine details of, of, of uh, agreeing specific tiny projects and dealing with press inquiries about soup kitchens and then deciding whether it was a good idea for the minister to be photographed next to the soup kitchens. That's the kind of level of stuff that we discussed. So it's absolutely crucial if we're to be a responsible international player and come anywhere near uh, being being global leader. And we certainly are. I don't agree with Dave. I think we are capable of being a global transformative leader in things like uh, science and education, for example. But to understand that, and possibly even finance, if we learn how to do finance responsibly. Um, to, to, to do those things, we need the right heads around the table, meeting regularly, talking, and actually leading that, linking that talk with action that is not just about donative projects. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Jamie, back to you for your line of questions. But am I allowed to move forward to um, more and better aid? I would be delighted if you did. Right. <laughs> well, well I, I'll try and be as possible to be first again. Um, the white paper, the Scottish Government white paper, um, enshrines the 7.7% for aid and hopes to move to a 1% uh, figure. Now, um, which is great. I, I, I think it's wonderful. But um, I'm interested in what the people here think about the ability of Scottish NGOs uh, to absorb that increase and to spend the increased available funding as it should be spent. Um, now, does this capacity and expertise exist in Scotland at the moment, or would it have to be created, and what would that creation cost again? Is that a is too broad a question? It's a tough question. <laughs> Dr. Mackey? I don't think the capacity exists in Scotland at the moment. I mean, I, I am not, uh, I, I don't have an in-depth knowledge of the Scottish uh, NGO scene like uh, Gillian does, but um, uh, it would require an awful lot of, uh, a, a lot of capacity. But I don't think you would be doing that. I mean, I don't think you'd be putting everything through NGOs. Um, we've talked about other, uh, um, other mechanisms, and uh, if, uh, you know, if, we'd, if it was set up, uh, if a, uh, a bilateral development agency was set up, then a proportion would go through that. But there, is, there are a lot of uh, agencies which can deliver aid around the world, far too many, in fact. Trust funds, funds of all sorts. Um, I, would thought that, I would have thought that it would be a question of choosing ones that you felt were, were particularly uh, um, professional, worked well in areas that you, um, that, uh, that you were interested in, um, and then focusing on those, obviously not spreading yourself too thinly in terms of those things. So you could be talking about the, the Global Fund for AIDS or, or TB or contributing to things like that. 
Uh, you could be talking to uh, about the Africa EU Infrastructure Trust Fund, contributing things like that, uh, and that will shift large sums of money. Um, or you could be putting money through budget support and then directly to the government of Malawi or the government of Zambia or whatever, and then you will need a certain amount of staff to monitor that, to manage it, uh, to uh, evaluate the way it's done, to, strike, uh, to, to work out the deals in terms of the finance, but you don't actually have to, ha to, to, de to deliver it, if you like. It will be the, the work in terms of development will be done by the government of Malawi or the government of Zambia. So I think there is a range of agencies and... Uh, um, be it from international uh, through to EU and down to um, partner country governments and then NGOs. Um, and it doesn't just have to be the Scottish NGOs too. I mean, I think you will find um, certainly across the EU, uh, uh, EU NGOs apply to different governments, not just their own. So you will get Danish NGOs asking for funds. You will get uh, um, Swedish or uh, French NGOs coming to the Scottish uh, government asking for funds. And the way the EU is structured, if you're in the EU, once you have independence, um, uh, you would expect to be able to answer those uh, demands. Ellen Wilson. We would totally agree that we wouldn't expect NGOs to absorb all the extra money. Um, and we wouldn't expect that. We currently support a very diverse aid program run through um, the UK government, for example. So absolutely, we wouldn't expect all that money to come through NGOs. And no, there is not capacity to absorb it all. However, we do think that um, civil society organisations bring a really important piece to the puzzle. And we would certainly um, value increased collaboration with some of these other partners. I think there's some really good examples of where um, NGOs have worked with business, for example. NGOs have worked with higher education institutions. Um, we obviously work very closely with southern NGOs. And a very important point that we were making, Dr. Mackey, about it's not just Scottish NGOs. It's also um, NGOs in the country. A lot of our work is about building local capacity for civil society. And so in the long run, I think um, Scotland might look at funding southern NGOs directly um, as it becomes a more mature donor, as DFID does. DFID welcomes applications from all over the world. So I would certainly see um, global NGOs being a channel for Scottish money in the long run. Um, but yeah, I, I think Scotland should, con should consider, um, and certainly we encourage our members to look at how they can be much more collaborative and work with other players, add the particular bit we bring, which is very much around civil society voice capacity, about engaging um, local people, about local knowledge, women's engagement, you know, very excluded um, groups in society, their engagement. So that, that's the bit that we really add value to and I think is a very important part of the picture. And we would hope that that would continue to be a part of Scotland's aid programme. Um, and, and, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if, if our guest today would be happy to continue this session on until 10.45. I know we've given you about 10 to 10.30, but I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of really good conversation going on around the table. And if you're comfortable to stay to 10.45, if that's okay. Yep. David Fish. I mean, it's going to take time, I think, for the Scottish Government to get to the 0.7 spending mark. So it took us, DFID, 50 years to get to that point um, and certainly you're only going to be able to spend that money initially if you do a lot of the things that James Mackey says and work through others um, what you will find though I think is that Scottish NGOs will grow as the program grows um, they won't be delivering programs in country those days have largely gone you know they work in partnership with local institutions and in lots of ways that's a civil society future I mean um, one of the interesting things we do a lot of now is try and get civil society organizations in country to hold their governments to account for their performance of course they do health and education and all the worthy things but actually funding again because I, I mentioned Sierra Leone because I was in House of Commons talking about that earlier in the week um, big problems there of the use of government funds, use of diamonds, money, corruption and everything else. And the beginning of some really interesting work by civil society to actually hold the government to account for its expenditure, both in terms of how the money is allocated but also the impact on when it's allocated. 
So I, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on the NGO element of it. And quite clearly, NGOs can't remotely spend a, anything approaching a, a billion pounds. Um, it's even more tricky, I guess, when uh, I, you probably gathered I'm English. Uh, but, you know, my kids and my wife and my dog and I'm Scottish, so I sort of, I feel, I feel at home. Um, but clearly the future um, economics are uncertain. It depends which publication you read or which politician you listen to. Um, but the point seven commitment in the face of that uncertainty is an incredibly brave thing to commit to. Um, but my advice was I wouldn't necessarily think you're going to spend point seven in year one unless actually you give it virtually all to the World Bank, the EU and the African Development Bank. So there's some tricky decisions for you to make in the middle of all that. Thank you. Colin Cameron. Cameron, um, I agree that on independence, Scotland's aid budget will be spread further than just the NGOs, as it is done just now. <clears throat> but I think it's fair to say that <clears throat> the, the NGOs and in Scotland are relatively... Uh, have a lot of spare capacity, and that can be utilised. And I think if we are talking sometimes of going to the bigger agencies, I think we must look at that with some caution if Scotland is taking a sort of independent sort of look at things. We must look at their accounts of these big company agencies and aid. How much of their money is spent internally in Scotland or in Britain on their internal expenses and the way they run them? If you are dealing with the smaller NGOs and allow their applications to be more straightforward, there will be more NGOs willing to apply with very useful projects in Scotland. I'm not saying that we don't go into bigger ones and other ones, but there are things which we feel concerned about in the amount of uh, travel that seems to be going, people going business class when we're dealing with aid. That seems to be a non-starter. And I, I'm talking just as examples, not... But, we must look at these bigger agencies if we're going to use them. They must come into parameters that the Scottish government set out. They must work within certain parameters to be able to function in the way that Scotland would like it, not the way that perhaps they would like to do it and have been in the habit of doing. And there's a lot of uh, scope to look that small is beautiful at times with that, but you'll need bigger projects. But there must be real scrutiny and track records of the bigger agencies that you want to use. And I think there, are such a, a, there is a lot of spare capacity in Scotland. And before we talk about moving into Denmark and other countries, which is fair enough, I think there are organisations throughout Scotland who are able and willing to participate. And I think the Scottish Government should look at that and try and facilitate the way that they can do so in the interests of the donee. Dr Holmes. Yes, um, and, and thank you, Colin Cameron, for reinforcing the perhaps the call for a code of conduct across all agencies working in development, because I agree entirely. It's, it's business, it's NGOs, it's anyone who's working in development. But on, on this issue, I, I think we should be looking at being more responsive and not sitting in Scotland saying what we think we should be doing, but actually responding to the needs of the countries. And I think this is really critical because at country level, you have your country cooperation agreements where governments and others have sat around the table and agreed what is good for the country. And I think then we should be responding to that. There are examples of basket funding where, you know, many countries put money into a basket. They don't necessarily know where it's going to. And for some countries, that's problematic because they like to have their emblem on a particular project. I think it's much more um, adventurous and also worthy to be, if you recognize that the 
government you're working with is accountable and has those measures in place, then I think it's much better to be starting this more equal partnership where we respond to what they say they need. And I think that's absolutely critical. But again, that does call for all of these measures around accountability, transparency. And we have to do a lot of work on that because that's one of the missing pieces at the moment. And the other thing I think that can be called for, and some countries are doing this, is they actually have in-country budgets, not only for gender spending, but also for civil society. And I think that's something we should be pushing for so that the governments themselves are building up their own capacity within the civil society networks. And as somebody previously said, it's often the civil societies who are the monitors of how money is being spent and accountability. Exploring that a bit more, Rod Campbell? And there was a couple of points I wanted to make. Just on the, the point seven point, I wondered whether what the panel's view why was on why it took 43 years and really what could be learned from international experience in other countries uh, and therefore really what, could, what's, what can Scotland learn from that point. Uh, and then moving on to something which touched on a uh, wee bit earlier was the uh, question of uh, gender equality, which is a millennium goal uh, and which the Scottish Government want to put at uh, the forefront of their plans. Uh, just really to ask uh, Dr Thin, you mentioned that you thought there should be a more nuanced approach to that. and uh, I just wanted if you could develop that further. So there's a couple of points if so, I could throw okay. out. I don't know which one, it, which one it, maybe you want to go first with yours and then we come back to the point seven one. That, that's fine, yes. Uh, on, on, the, on the gender equality, it's just uh, that, that we in, in Edinburgh University, obviously a lot of us have worked under the rubric of uh, gender equality. It's a strong and widely understood rubric, so it's lots to, to say for it. But it absolutely, um, you know, it's a bit like the do no harm. It doesn't make philosophical sense, because in practice, if you push it too hard, uh, people don't underst uh, under understand what it could possibly mean in practice. So gender justice um, equal, uh, and gender equity in specific sectors tend to work better as actual uh, 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 as, as procedures and as, uh, and, and as uh, rubrics. Um, the other p point about the, the, the querying of gender uh, e equality as a kind of utopian, giant, overarching goal, uh, the other point that lay behind that was, I think it would, it, if you're going to bring the, the, the Scottish public behind a big, ambitious programme, you need ambitious, energising, uh, overall um, inspiring objectives, inspiring goals. Uh, uh, gender justice could form such a goal, but if you just leave it as something that isn't explained, uh, sort of gender equality as, as, a, sort of, as, as a principle, um, you would have to work an awful lot harder to actually explain to people in practice what, that, what kinds of changes would you bring about. That's, that's where the Millennium Development Goals really, really worked very well, because they started specifying for a global public under these kinds of global objectives and that are achievable, we really think these things can be achieved. Okay. On the 0.7%, perhaps, uh, I mean, I, why it took so long, there's a whole history for that, and, which I don't think we want to go into in, in terms of international uh, relations and uh, uh, the Cold War, the, uh, the sort of disillusionment with aid and so on. Um, I think the, the, the rise of uh, security concerns, international security concerns, uh, pushed certainly European governments to realize that actually it was important to, to make much bigger effort on development. The arrival of the MDGs, that finally we had a, a sort of set of goals internationally which people could rally around and therefore it made sense to have the money. But I think what we need to get in, in, in context is that the needs are actually much, much greater. I mean, international development, particularly when you factor in climate change issues, we're talking about much larger sums of money, and 0.7% is not going to get us there. I mean, and if you look at uh, ODA, uh, at Overseas Development Assistance, it's actually only a small fraction of the, the, the major flows of international finance, uh, et cetera, and we, we need to keep those in mind. Um, remittances, for instance, outweigh three to one uh, um, uh, development corporation uh, funds. So that is also an area you could be doing something about making sure that Scottish banks transfer uh, remittances uh, at low cost uh, and safe, safely. Um, international financial flows, uh, investment, there are codes of conduct there, Dr. Holmans has referred to that, um, uh, the importance of that. International, 
illicit financial flows. Uh, uh, Gillian Wilson referred to the, the need for coherence on those areas. So there is a lot of areas that uh, uh, come under development finance, and there's a very interesting debate going on at the moment at the level of the UN, parallel to defining the goals for the post-2015 is how are we going to pay for it. Um, and there, I, I think we see all these factors coming in. Um, what is special about aid is that it, is, it tends to be less strings attached to it. There are always some, but it tends to have less strings attached, and if you pass it over to governments or to beneficiaries on the ground, they have a say how they use it. There's, they, they, they have much more control of it, and that is important. But the debate in the UN is also about what are the other means of implementation other than finance, uh, which are important, and that's where we get back to the, the point about policy coherence, that there are all sorts of policies which actually can reduce the need for finance. You can, you can if you have, for instance, just to take the example of, of, uh, of uh, drugs for AIDS, as long as the pharmaceutical companies wanted to send, sell them at, uh, at a profit, um, then it was exorbitant. You couldn't afford to, to have those drugs on the market. But once you get to an agreement that uh, the, these drugs can be sold at, uh, at a lower price, then suddenly it becomes affordable to, to, to spread them across Africa. So I think aid is vital. I mean, and we're not... I disagree with Gillian there. I don't think we will ever get rid of aid. It's one of the, it's one of the only mechanisms we have for international redistribution of funds, uh, if you think about it, uh, in the hands of government. So we will probably always want that. It may not go uh, in the future, may not go down to individual projects and programs. We may be talking much more at the sort of public goods level, but we, governments will need to support that. But I think there will always be that, that need for making, uh, for making uh, financial contributions to an international public good. Um, and so I, I see that continuing. Um, but if we can surround it by coherent policies, policies which are conducive to development, if we can design our fisheries policy so it doesn't uh, impinge on, on African fishery grounds, if we can design our trade policy so it doesn't undercut local markets, etc., all that can reduce the need for aid and promote development. Thank you. Okay, Jillian Wilson. Um, I just want to come back on two things. So in terms of um, the point that Colin made about um, large NGOs and also the issue around effectiveness, um, absolutely, I think NGOs, along with other players, ought to be accountable. And um, one of the big programmes that NIDOS has um, is an effectiveness programme. So the Scottish Government has funded us to develop um, a, a toolkit and we are actively engaging our members in use of this, which reviews how they operate both philosophically in development, but also in terms of resource use, um, et cetera. And we are increasingly getting engagement of our members to be self-reflective, self-critical. So I think that's absolutely important for us as well as other players. However, um, I, I am a bit concerned that people have a kind of um, blanket thing that big organisations are wasteful of money. I think there are some large organisations that spend money inefficiently, but however, there are some large organisations that are using money that may be seen to be not happening in the field, but for some very vital and important things around campaign and policy development globally. So I think it's absolutely vital that we have a diverse international NGO sector in Scotland that has large players, medium players, small players doing all sorts of different things because some of the larger organisations, for example, last year quite a few of you might have heard of the IF campaign, looking at the issues of food security, land grabbing, tax evasion, all those sorts of things, like there's plenty of food in the world but people aren't accessing it. We need some players to be spending both public donated money but also campaign money from whoever will give it to us to really be pushing some of these issues. And I think sometimes large organisations are misrepresented when they say large sums of money are, are wasted in the UK. These sums of money are often invested in changing public attitudes, putting forward constructive policy. So I think um, I, whenever people refer to large organisations in a very general sense of being wasteful of money, I, I think that's unhelpful. I think it's good if people are critical about specific wastes of money and, and our sector will put its hand up and say, yes, there are a misuse of resources, as there are in bilateral agencies, the UN, government, you know, businesses, etc. So absolutely, effectiveness is important. Um, we very much welcome the Scottish Government 
supporting the development of a diverse um, NGO sector in Scotland. So the Scotland Malawi Partnership and ourselves very actively lobbied for a small grants programme under the International Development Fund uh, for a number of years. We're very happy to have seen the first year of, the, of a three-year pilot running just in the last year, and we think this is the way to go, is to have a diverse aid programme that supports the diversity of NGOs, builds the capacity of smaller organisations to grow, absorb some of the capacity of an increased aid programme, if that is what happens, but also to do it much better and to be more collaborative. But I think um, I also wanted to come back on the aid issue 0 0.7 and how we use aid. I think our sector would be very clear in saying that we, we don't agree with tied aid and the way in which aid might creep into the military spend. We feel that um, however, however well um, intentioned the military might be, they have real conflicts of interest when it comes to developing relationships and aid programs. They don't have a lot of experience and the aid that they deliver is often not of good quality. And so I think it's very, very important that the Scottish Government keeps ODA within its bounds and doesn't use um, aid to support domestic business growth. Um, you know, we should be giving aid that is in, in um, alignment with what local people, local governments need and want, and that we should be driven by their priorities, not by what is good for Scottish business. But the policy coherence side of it, I think, gives that opportunity for Scottish business to add its value to good in the world, to adding value to other people's economies. And I think that's the area, um, you know, which is interesting to, to develop in the future, is, is that wider picture. But I think aid itself shouldn't either be used for military purposes or for pursuing Scottish commercial interests. Yeah. Oh, Anderson. Um, it was just on, on the question of gender in inequality um, to mention that uh, uh, Hamza Youssef, as uh, Minister for uh, International Development, um, had uh, initiated the setting up of the Pakistan um, Scottish Scholarship Scheme for Women. Uh, and um, we're managing this, British Council in Pakistan. Um, so it's funded by the Scottish Government, promoting... Uh, women's access to higher education. Seventy uh, women have been awarded scholarships for two years of study uh, across 25 uh, higher education institutions um, in ed areas of uh, education, food security, agriculture, and sustainable energy. There has been a focus on, on, on women from rural and uh, underprivileged uh, urban areas. Um, who, who have uh, some social disadvantage and, and um, financial need, but also showing academic promise. So that scheme is going well. Okay, thank you. Hans Alaf Malik. Um, thank you very much. Um, Code of Conduct, International Aid, Overseas Development, uh, all fancy words, but they all mean the same thing, and that is that how do we support human beings across the world? That's the bottom line, really. Um, However, uh, the most important and the most fundamental issue of all of these is, is where the money actually ends up and what percentage of that actually ends up to the coal face. I think that's important. And, you know, we've heard uh, outrageous stories about people traveling first class and living in five-star hotels and, and it's charity money. And, yes, that's absolutely crucial. However, that said... One needs to be a bit careful when one becomes to start to dictate whether any of the armed forces can use any of the money because some of these countries are on a knife edge in terms of security. Some of that security doesn't only affect them, it actually indirectly affects us. So uh, I think sometimes we need to be a bit more guarded of uh, how prescriptive we want to be for countries uh, which security services may use some of that aid indirectly. Now, uh, I know that um, in, in terms of uh, hist history, uh, we in the UK have been guilty of propping up governments which are not democratically elected, and I, I, I wouldn't want to see that repeated in Scotland. I think that's important that we only, only um, support democratically elected governments around the world, but 
numbers is also important. I don't think we want to overstretch ourselves so that the aid actually becomes meaningless uh, because it's it's so so little. But I think one of the things that I'm I'm I'm, I'm quite encouraged to hear today uh, from my colleagues and people on the table that we seem to have learned enough lessons from history that we can actually improve on what we've been doing historically. And I would like to see a reduction in costs of administrating any overseas budgets. And um, so far in the Scottish Government, we seem to have done not a bad job in not over, overly spend on the uh, direction of funding and how we use that funding. However, I need to say that DFID is something that we would have to revisit if there was a, an independent scout on how we would deal with that element of the funding because that is quite technical and it is also uh, perhaps a, a percentage we would want to look at or even realign the aid that is going places. But I take on the point about Malawi and, uh, and other places where it's unhelpful if we stop funding in middle of stream so that you know uh, you lose the effectiveness of that funding because if you've established a hospital university college or whatever and then you pull the plug on people i think that's that's actually quite cruel because it means that uh, not only have the recipient failed but we the donor have also failed in in what we've tried to achieve so um although there are there are um, challenges but i think we seem to have learned a great deal historically, and I think we can use that to our advantage. So uh, I've heard a lot of very positive things today, uh, and I hope that we can continue to build on that. And thank you very much for your uh, insights and your sharing the experiences that you have with me today. I've, I've picked up a lot today. Thank you. David Fish. Uh, make three very quick points. Um, the running cost one is very important. And I would agree with Gillian. I mean, the world's moved on a lot in terms of the scrutiny that we give to organisations we work in partnership with. Um, I spent my whole career travelling business class. As you can see, I'm not built for economy. Um, so when that change came in, it was uh, not something I personally necessarily agreed with. But DFID, for example, now you do normally travel economy, you'd be pleased to know. But it is very important that whatever you do and whoever you work through, that you get a grip on their running costs. And that applies to international organisations in particular in some ways. Uh, second point I make is about your point about the military is exactly right. I mean, if you go to a refugee camp in Syria and you ask the people, you know, what, what do you most want? They will, I guarantee you, they will tell you, I want to wake up in the morning. They don't necessarily say, I want health, education and water, but of course they do. But peace and security are absolutely vital in a lot of these countries we work in. Um, and one of the things about budget support, for example, clearly we shouldn't be putting aid money into buying weapons and things that aren't appropriate. But budget support, whether we like it or not, does go to run the military in the countries we're working in. The interesting thing about that, it gives us a legitimate voice in discussion with the government about what is the level of their military investment that's appropriate, given the size of the country, given the security situation in the country. It's a really important part of development, and we should never forget it. The final point I make um, relates a bit to the point seven point. Um, there's not a lot of votes for you guys in international development. That's... that's the brutal truth. Um, as I say, I live in a small, well-to-do village in Lanarkshire where all the people are very socially conscious and you know, care about each other. But it's really difficult for me to persuade them that I use their taxes efficiently, effectively, and get results. And one of the things that a lot of people in India, you know, I can say it now, I'm not there, that people in DFID would say, we've not been very good at getting our story out. We've not been very good at persuading people that actually this 0.7 we're spending on your behalf is really making a difference. Um, so one of the things I would urge Scotland to do is really develop a programme of telling the people of Scotland what they're getting for their buck. Scottish people, in my experience, are pretty...
caring about each other. The stories that we can tell, I know, would get people <coughs> saying, oh, well, that's all right then. Um, but as I say, I don't think the British Aid Programme has done enough of that. Partly it's because it doesn't sell newspapers. Uh, but it will never sell the Daily Mail. But it could well help sell the Daily Record if you present it in the right way. Um, so if you're going to go to point seven, you're going to need public support for it. The best way to do it is to get the story out there and do some of the development education that people were talking about. 1978, I was the head of DFID's development education unit, and we mounted a major program of going into schools, including in Scotland, telling kids about issues in the third world, telling them what, we're, what development issues were. And it was hugely successful. There was a massive take-up, you're probably not old enough to remember, but you know, centres of development education were springing up all over the place. We did quite a lot of work in schools, primary schools even, but secondary schools and some of the universities. Um, when the Tories came in in 1979, they scrapped it. By and large, I think they didn't want a particularly strong voice in favour of development. Um, but nevertheless, it, I could see in the two years that it really ran that it was having an impact. So running a development education programme, I would recommend it. On camera. Uh, I will be very short. Yeah. Um, I think we're missing a bit of the point here, the whole thing, in the nice to say. Scotland's a country of principle, and their principle is as to how we use on independence uh, the money that the Scotland is going to allocate, in whose hands is safer to, to, to use our money. And we, I think it's only fair to say that we've had the union since 1707, and it's never been fully blown because there's always been things retained to Scotland, whether it's education law, banks, church, or whatever. And then we've got more with devolution. Here we've got more coming out now before the 18th of Sep September of all the things that are being offered. Uh, my, my own feeling is that to, in order to get the international aid side fully in Scottish hands and safe is to try and bring both sides together, the yes and the no, and maybe bring their slogans together. And, and if the slogan was, yes, through independence, we're, a, we're better together. I think that is what we should be aiming for for Scotland and obviously for the rest of Great Britain. I think the case is unanswerable. And I think we all know it makes sense. And, and that's the one way that we can identify that Scotland's aid will be in safe hands. That's just a personal view. Adamson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'd just like to, to address the, the, the comments of Mr Fish there about not many votes in it. It's not my experience as a politician at all that there isn't votes in international development and where Scotland stands as a country in this area, whether that's at church hustings. Um, Scottish Malawi Partnership did an excellent amount of work and uh, discovered that there are tens of thousands pe of people in Scotland involved in, 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 in Malawi, um, raising money, visiting schools all over Scotland. And I think the experience of the Mary's Meals issue with a young lady in, um, who was blogging about a school dinner, is that I, I think there's an incredible amount of interest in Scotland in international development and, and where people want to see our country uh, on the world stage in this issue. Okay, Willie Coffey, finally. Thanks very much. Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Coffey, but we, we've, we've even stretched the extra time that I managed. Right. One of the disadvantages of sitting away down here on the left-hand side is that you can't attract the convener's attention. Uh, and, a, and a number of the points have been made by many colleagues around the table, but I, I wanted to make three brief points then because we're at the stage we are in the discussion, convener. The first on the point, 7%, I mean, I'm, I'm pleased to see that commitment by the Scottish Government to enshrine that in legislation. Uh, and the value of it, members have mentioned, is could be around a billion pounds a year. And I don't see that. I don't see that commitment from the UK government to maintain. I mean, somebody mentioned that they've just actually managed to to reach the 0.7 percent after about 40 or 50 years. So, I mean, if that's an example of leadership, then it's not one that I would hope that an independent Scotland would follow. So, I would hope we would maybe get to that point much quicker. Just on the point about leadership and, and so on. I, I think Mr Fish got the wrong 
end of the stick there. It, it's not about bigness. It's about demonstrating leadership, and I think that can be adequately demonstrated by even the smallest countries, particularly in Europe, particularly Luxembourg, who do uh, live up to their obligations and make the kind of level of commitment commensurate with their size, and it exceeds what the UK has, has contributed. Uh, but there's no time left, convener. I, I wanted to open up a wee chat about the, the connection between aid, international development, and the debt relief cycle, and how we might break that cycle, because it seems to me, and it might seem to people out, outside, that we, we donate money through international uh, commitments only to get it back in debt repayments. And I think, Dr Anderson, you mentioned, was it Jamaica's case where they pay 50 cents on the dollar in terms of debt? I mean, that is just ridiculous, that kind of situation. So the, a question possibly for the future meeting convener is, how do we break that cycle? Who, who collectively should get together to look at issues like that, about debt relief and unfair debt, and how do we address that and, and what the impacts might, the practical impacts of that might be for countries that are suffering that debt and how might we best advantage them to, to take their own futures in their own hands? Is there anybody who wants to come back on that just very, very quickly? Yeah, I'm, I'm, we are really, really out of time. I think we are really out of time. Um, it would be great to, to spend much more, but we have other things on our agenda this morning, and it would be wonderful to sit and, 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 and talk more. Um, if we, we are continuing these one-off inquiries until the end of June, if there's anything that we've not covered today that you are really keen to say, can you please send it in? Because every single piece of evidence we get is very, very valuable. It's very relevant, um, and we may have missed a whole section. Hopefully we've not. I think we've covered... Uh, all the, the main and general points as well. Um, but if there's anything that you think would help us in our deliberations um, to take forward our inquiry, that would be very helpful indeed. And can I take the opportunity behalf of the committee to thank you all this morning? We really could have sat with you for hours um, and, and maybe we'll have other opportunities to do that. Um, but we, we're very, very grateful for your participation this morning and, and your uh, very, very, very interesting and very relevant um, contributions to the committee. And we look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you. I'm going to take a 10-minute recess, so if you'll be back in your seats for 11.05, please. We are not going to get...
go, go back. Mm -hmm. um, welcome back to the European and External Relations Committee. Agenda item two is the Brussels Bulletin. Uh, members have a copy of the Brussels Bulletin in their papers. Um, and just to remind members that the European Parliament is now in campaign mode. Um, so the Brussels Bulletin is quite, quite light. Can I ask for any comments, questions, clarifications on the Brussels Bulletin? Jimmy. Um, just the thing about cross-border pensions. Um, Contrary to expectations, the proposal maintains the requirement that cross-border pensions be fully funded at all times. Um, we were led to believe there was something different there, wasn't there? Um, that something different was going to happen. I just wondered if there were any reasons for, 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 for that having happened. Yeah, interestingly, the, the draft that came out, I think, was that there was going to be a change to that, but the final result was that there wasn't a change to it. Um, I don't know whether we can get some further clarification on that yet. Yeah, we can seek some clar clarification, yeah. Do that, Jamie, and I'll let you to it when it, when it comes in. Rod. Uh, I just noticed in terms of the timetable, European Parliament update, there's a televised debate between the European Commission president candidates nominated by EU-level political parties, but uh, can anyone or can, can we get information as to how this is being televised? You know, is it going to be on BBC or what? Uh, um, or do you have to watch it on the internet or something? Yeah. Just for general information, if you can find that out. Yeah, we can find out the details for that and make sure you get get those. Any other questions? No. Nope. Willy coffee. <laughs> Not waving, drowning. <laughs> I'm not sitting here again. <laughs> um, could I mention something convener on um, innovation investment? There's a wee paragraph down there on page five of the bulletin. It talks about innovation investment and 22 billion euros and so on, and it covers a, a, a number of areas, and one of them is, is medicines, right? And I, and I raise this because of the event we had last night in the Parliament on MS, and I regularly hear, and I'm sure members regularly hear, about the availability of medicines in the different jurisdictions. Scotland being one of them, of course, and there's, there's quite a variety in approach as to which, what medicines are available in which countries and licensed and so on and so forth. Is there any thinking, does anyone know uh, within Europe, to try to standardise this or, or in, in any kind of way so that people throughout Europe, even, for example, can have the same kind of equality of access to licensed and approved medicines that might be available? Because you, you hear about people scanning the internet for this drug or that drug, and, the, and you can buy uh, this drug or that drug over the internet, and that's probably not the best way to do this kind of thing. So I just thought I'd flag this up, convener, because it's a really important topic for people out there. And if the European Union is doing something on that, on that area, then it might be something that's worth picking up at the committee at a future date. We did some previous work a while back on cross-border healthcare, um, which seems that would be, a, you know, a logical extension to that. So we'll do we'll do some research on that and come back. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Alec Rowley. Sorry, the convener for being late to come back. See on the um, the brief here, the pensions and the fact that contrary to expectations, the proposal maintains the requirement that cross-border pension be fully funded at all times. Have we previously done any work on that in the committee, or is it possible to get a more detailed brief of what that actually means in terms of, obviously, if Scotland were to become an independent state, what would it mean for for, for people in Scotland who, who have these, these pensions? Yep, Jamie, beat you to the, the crunch well, on they? that one, because that was... Did, that was I, I did ask exactly that question. Exactly right. that question. <laughs> we'll, we'll, the clerks are going to do some um, research on that and come back to us on it. OK. Anything else? Happy to make the Brussels Bulletin available to other committees. Will we alert the Health Committee um, in particular about the health issues, yeah? Yeah, the medicines, yep. Yeah. Okay. If you're happy to do that, yep, yeah. yeah. delighted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, agenda item three, we have agreed to take in private, so we now move into private. <laughs>